in the courts. And it's related to the Brandon Phillips murder trial, as well as documents that Dwight Ball wanted kept from public view. CBC News was in court today along with Dwight Ball's lawyers. Earlier this month, the Premier was granted a temporary publication ban on documents related to the Brandon Phillips murder trial. They were entered as evidence but were never shown to the jury. Well, CBC went to court to access those documents, but at the last minute, a judge granted Ball a temporary injunction. Today, that same judge partially lifted the ban. So, here and now can finally tell you how our soon-to-be premier was plunged into a murder investigation. Here now is Ariana Kellen joins us to break this down. Ariana. Well, this is an ITO, short for information to obtain a search warrant. It has all the information police needed to search Brandon Phillips' mother's house a week after the shooting at the Captain's Quarters Hotel. And there is one unexpected person front and center in these documents, Dwight Ball. He was weeks away from becoming premier, and he provided information that helped police crack the murder case. December 2015. Dwight Ball hits the height of his political career, becoming the 13th person to lead the province. His victory at the polls was easy. Behind the scenes, his private life was anything but. Ten months earlier, things began to unravel. Dwight Ball would explain it all to police. His daughter Jade Ball had been in an on-again, off-again relationship with Brandon Phillips. They had known each other for about five years, both battled a very serious opiate problem. Dwight Ball told police he paid off the couple's debts in previous years and moved them to Deer Lake. They later returned to St. John's and the problems began again. In January 2015, Dwight Ball began noticing tens of thousands of dollars being charged to his credit card. By August of that year, things had escalated. As Ball prepared for a fall election, TVs were stolen from his condo at the Tiffany in St. John's. Then someone bought a car worth upwards of $12,000 using his credit card. Ball told police the person at the Royal Garage sold the vehicle using the digits of his credit card without the person actually having a credit card as proof. He said Brandon Phillips and Jared Cody were the ones who did it. Jared Cody and his girlfriend, Caitlin Skinner, were tenants at a home owned by Jade and Dwight Ball. Dwight Ball would get text messages from Cody and Facebook messages from Skinner. It involved unpaid drug debt related to Phillips, tens of thousands of dollars. Jade Ball texted her father and said she too was being harassed. Someone even showed up at her workplace to get the message across. Then, on October 2nd, the tires on her Audi were slashed while the car was parked outside the spa at the monastery. The next day, Brandon Phillips and his friends were drinking at Jade Ball's condo at the Sundera, a building owned by her father. Shortly before midnight, a masked man would enter the captain's quarters. Desperately demanding cash, he would take Larry Wellman's life. And as we now know, Brandon Phillips was the man behind the mask. A jury found him guilty of second-degree murder earlier this month. But how did police zero in on their suspect? Here's the answer. As word spreads of a possible murder at the captain's quarters, Brandon Phillips confesses to a different crime a blunt admission to stealing from the soon-to-be premier, as Phillips dealt with overwhelming debt, tens of thousands of dollars. He texts Dwight Ball. I've been taking your TVs, he says, and putting them into traders. Going to Humberwood, I just found out I'm an addict, and you, Dwight, have been paying. Jade is in danger because of all I have done. I owe that guy Jared Cody 20000 and when I couldn't pay him, he started targeting Jade because he knows she's my ex-girlfriend and who her parents are. Jade had nothing to do with any of what went on. I gave your credit card number to Jared, and she knows nothing about it. Like I told Jade before, I'm willing to take responsibility for everything. Phillips admits to picking the lock at Dwight Ball's condo, getting inside, and stealing TVs. 24 hours later, police expand their search into who killed Larry Wellman. 
The next day, Jade Ball takes it a step further and tells police about Jared Cody and his alleged harassment. Miss Ball states since the harassment has started, the persons responsible have now been harassing her father for the money and at one point bought a car using her father's stolen credit card number. The harassment wasn't just coming from Jared Cody though. Jade Ball says it was also coming from third party people like Felicia Pinn, the sister of convicted killer Philip Pinn. But Jade Ball decided against filing an official report. She said she'd speak with her father first. Her father, meanwhile, was dealing with another problem. The tires on his car were slashed, a window and headlight damaged. What Jade Ball and Brandon Phillips didn't know was that the RNC was keeping a close eye on both of them, following the couple as they drove from Phillips' mother's house on Kitty Vitty Road to Dwight Ball's condo at the Tiffany where Jade Ball had been living. Officers watched as cars came and went from the house on Kitty Vitty Road. October 8th, five days after the shooting. Still no arrests, but police have released this a still image of the suspect. He wore a black hooded jacket, a white logo on the front. Strange, because Dwight Ball had a jacket just like that one, a jacket that went missing months before. He texts his daughter about it and she returns it to her father's condo. Suspicious, it was Dwight Ball who goes to police next. He tells then RNC Sergeant Tom Warren the gunman may be Brandon Phillips, a man who had dated his daughter for years. And not only that, Phillips may have been wearing Dwight Ball's jacket when he committed the crime. Meanwhile on the street, police were gathering their case against their prime suspect. A tossed cigarette, now DNA evidence. There's enough to make an arrest. In his mother's home, the case against Brandon Phillips is mounting. A gun, a shotgun shell, sneakers with the DNA of shooting victim Larry Wellman. But the investigation isn't over and police continue questioning people. Jared Cody talks to police and says what he does is no secret. He says he was paid off with prepaid credit cards bought using Dwight Ball's credit card. He even admits to buying that car at Royal Garage. You may not like the medicine that I'm delivering here today, but these are the facts. From the outside looking in, things were going well. Ball was gearing up for the election, debating the other leaders at Munn, getting ready to hit the campaign trail. But the next day, there's one more visit with the police. Ball talks to the RNC to complain of harassing Facebook messages from someone else. This is the last communication with Dwight Ball referenced in the police search warrant documents. What a great night! A month and a half after Larry Wellman is killed, Dwight Ball and his Liberal Party sweep to victory, a public triumph after months of private turmoil. Well, the story that these documents tell are incredible, Arianna, but if these were entered into evidence, why did the jury never get a chance to actually see them? Well, the defense originally tried to get those search warrants thrown out as evidence, but they weren't successful, but they did become part of the court record in the process. The Crown did have the option to call Dwight Ball and Jade Ball as witnesses, but ultimately it was decided they could get a conviction without their testimony, and of course they did. Phillips will be sentenced for second-degree murder in the new year. Debbie? Thanks very much. Arianna Kelland live in our studio tonight. Well, Ann Squires filed another lawsuit against people she says lent her money to keep her now defunct business afloat. Court documents obtained by the CBC News show that Squires is suing her former accountant at Exit Realty on the Rock for just over $1.2 million. Here now's Fred Hutton has our story. The statement of claim names Exit Realty on the Rock's former controller Chad Kennedy, his brother Sean Kennedy, Matthew Rogers and two companies linked to Rogers as the defendants. It's one of several lawsuits launched by Squires, whose company had its real estate license suspended in February of 2016, which later went into receivership. A police investigation resulted in charges of theft, fraud and breach of trust against Squires. In a lawsuit filed on Friday, Squires claims that Chad Kennedy knew about her company's financial situation and offered to help get her some extra money. 
He introduced her to his brother, Sean, and to a business associate, Matthew Rogers. She says at times, the three men charged her criminal interest rates of at times more than 342%. As a result, she says she couldn't pay and received threatening emails from Chad Kennedy. In the end, she's seeking $1.2 million in damages. Squires also alleges that Chad Kennedy, in his role as her company's controller, falsified the company's financial statements and forged her signature on checks. None of the allegations has been tested in court and no statement of defense had been filed as of today. Squires has launched similar lawsuits against former St. John's Deputy Mayor Ron Ellsworth for $137,000 and a former business associate Bruce Mullet for $61,000. Court documents detail Ron Ellsworth's denials in that case. As for the criminal charges against Ann Squires for fraud, theft, forgery and breach of trust, they'll be back in provincial court in March for a preliminary hearing. For Here and Now, Fred Hutton, CBC News, St. John's. A woman has been charged in the death of 17-year-old high school student Justin Hines. Hines was killed walking to school on September 11th in Cowhead. Rocky Harbor RCMP say 56-year-old Neela Blanchard is charged with dangerous operation of a motor vehicle causing death. She's due in court on Tuesday. Family, friends and colleagues are remembering John Hickey as a force for Labrador. The 62-year-old mayor and former MHA died Thursday night after suffering a gunshot wound in a hunting accident. A memorial service was held today in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Here now's Katie Breen was there. Katie, what can you tell us about it? Well, outside the service today, cars filled the parking lot and lined the streets. Hundreds of people came out to pay their respects. Well, it's a sad day for, for Goose Bay, uh, certainly all of Labrador, but, you know, our whole town seems to be in mourning. And uh, I guess this is the last, uh, the last thing we can do for John is to try and give him a good send-off. He deserves it. No diamonds or gold. John touched so many lives, it didn't matter which side of the political spectrum. Uh, people, I think, really gravitated towards his character, and he had a very large heart, and he cared for people, and he cared for Labrador. So today is about uh, honoring a man who gave a lot to Labrador, and now it's kind of like uh, giving back to a guy by showing him how much uh, he meant to everybody. Today, on behalf of all Labradorians, we offer our sincere and heartfelt sympathy to his family and friends. And lived a life that was free. You know, what was our fight was his fight. And, and that's, that's who John was. He was always a person that was going to have, have his say and, and uh, make sure that we were going to try to get what we could for uh, the people here in Labrador. Doctors were at first hopeful that John Hickey would overcome his injuries. Friends and family were devastated on Thursday when they received the news. An active 62-year-old, Hickey still had a lot of life left to live. Reporting live in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. Some breaking news for hockey fans now, and it has to do with Hockey Night in Canada and CBC's continuing role in the historic broadcast. Rogers Media and CBC have signed a new sub-licing agreement for Hockey Night in Canada and the Stanley Cup playoffs. It extends the broadcast partnership for seven more years. Rogers says the agreement ensures that Hockey Night in Canada will reach the maximum number of Canadians every Saturday night on CBC as well as Sportsnet. And you'll also be able to keep watching Hockey Night in Canada on CBC apps and cbcsports.ca. Well, Southeast Bight on the Buren Peninsula is only accessible by boat. Yesterday, police pulled up to the wharf with a special guest in tow to keep a long-standing Christmas tradition. Here's elementary school Elena White describing it all to the St. John's Morning Show. It started as a, a joke, really, because we, we started collecting coats for kids and happy tree gifts. And the RCMP had it on the radio that uh, they would pick them up anywhere on the Buren Peninsula. So I called and just happened to hit the right person with the right uh, incentive. And it started as a tradition that they come and pick up our uh, happy tree gifts, um, our coats for kids. And uh, in the last few years, our volunteer fire department has started a food drive. 
So we've got a, a gym full of jackets and coats and boxes of food and many gifts that will be given to children who are not as fortunate as our students. Many years ago, uh, the RCMP would come here and bring gifts to the children. Back, you know, a couple of three or four generations, you know, at a time when the fishery was bad and there was big families and people didn't have a lot. Uh, out of that, uh, the children who were receiving then uh, decided that they wanted to give back. And as the parents and now grandparents in this community, they, they started this tradition at, at our school. And, you know, it's about teaching our children that uh, everybody doesn't have a perfect Christmas like they do and that it's good to, to help others. Oh, oh that nice was story. great. Yeah. And see Santa there in fine form, yeah. high-fiving on yeah. board. Yeah, he, really does, he does get everywhere. He does. <laughs> he does get everywhere, sure. right? One way or another. Uh, and nice that he could get there. The weather was clear enough. Yeah. And... Uh, as we move over the next couple days, well, certainly a bigger disturbance coming in. If you do have some travel plans, especially for western parts of Newfoundland, Wednesday night into Thursday, things are going to turn a little on the dicey side there. We do have some snow to contend with tomorrow morning. We'll talk about that, but this is the big picture for Wednesday and Thursday. Again, a bit of a messy mix, and then the snow squalls fire up, as I said, Wednesday night through Thursday, even into Friday along the west coast. Could see some significant snowfall amounts there. We'll talk about that coming up. Blustery conditions, certainly the name of the game. The other big story, Labrador, and some significant accumulation there, especially uh, for the coast of Labrador, but even Happy Valley Goose Bay, the possibility of 20 centimeters or perhaps a little bit more. So we'll talk more about this with your full weather forecast the next three days in detail in just a few minutes. A local firefighter honored for battling the Fort Mac Inferno. Once we got into the city, there was just nobody there.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The town of Fort McMurray has recognized a St. John's area firefighter for his efforts during the destructive wildfires in May of 2016. St. John's Fire Chief Jerry Peach made the presentation to Terry Edwards on behalf of the Alberta town, and I caught up with Terry Edwards at the relatively new fire station in Paradise. Well, first of all, congratulations on uh, getting recognized for what you did in Fort Mac. Thank you. It's quite the accolade. So a lot of us remember that extraordinary time. What was it like to fight that fire, be part of that effort? Uh, it was quite remarkable, actually. Uh, it's not something that you, uh, you know, would predict by any means, uh, due to the magnitude, of course. Um, but yeah, it uh, it escalated pretty quickly. So I was on my three night shifts, just finishing up from working a six days on, six days off schedule. So we were in a, working our three night shifts, and the fire was approaching the city at that time, in late April. We were quite busy, obviously. Uh, and the chief of the city department was trying to get everybody safely out of McMurray. That was probably the biggest task from his point of view. Right. And, um, and of course, people were kind of fleeing north and south. Um, if you're not familiar with McMurray, there is only one way in and out of there. So that got pretty tricky with regards to the fire because the fire was jumping the highway at numerous times. So um, they had to make quick decisions. Um, and yeah, so a lot of people got dropped off at site. So I worked with Syncrude, of course, and the oil uh, company. Yeah, yeah and uh, people were actually going to Suncor, CNRL, Albion Sands, anywhere, and all the camps that are up along the highway as well. So, well, let me ask you this: You obviously uh, you're a firefighter. You trained for this. How was the, the fire in Fort Mac? How was that different from other fires that you fought? Because obviously, wildfires are a fact of life in Alberta. This one isn't a league of its own. What, stu what stands out in your mind about that fire? Just simply the magnitude and how quickly it outgrew the resources in which we had to attack it. Um, I mean, as you know, it, firefighters flew in not only from Alberta, but the country and other parts of the world. So um, the main thing I think once it got out of control was trying to mitigate it and trying to keep it outside of the city the best we could. And I think we did a good job of that. And we. Uh, we're able to save a lot of the major infrastructure and bridges and schools and, and hockey rinks and so on. So yeah, People forget about that despite the devastation that a lot of the main infrastructure was actually saved. Is there a particular story about that fire, somebody that you helped out or something that you, you kind of remember more than others? Early in my shift, I guess, on, uh, on in early May was a pregnant lady that uh, she was a resident of Fort Mackay. Um, Fort Mackay is? Fort Mackay is yeah. an area in which we have mutual aid to um, as a reserve up north of the Syncrude site. Right. So we went to the band office there and, and had her packaged up and, and had to organize a helicopter to get her deported down to, to Edmonton. Right. So she was in active labor. So that was kind of, you know, odd, yeah. I guess. Is Woman that. having a baby during, <laughs> during the fire. So, um, but no, just, I mean, it all kind of blended in together. Um, and then, of course, what was different, I guess, was so many people being on site. We normally would just be the working force that was on site, but we had babies and geriatric people and pets and a lot of odd things that we weren't used to seeing yeah. on a daily basis there. And then once we got into the city, there was just nobody there. I mean, everybody had left. So from a firefighting point of view, it was all defensive for the most part. Um, there was no real interior attack. Um, so. Well, the police chief this week uh, thanked you on behalf of uh, Fort McMurray, and uh, congratulations once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Pretty laid back guy now. I said police chief, but obviously I meant uh, the fire chief. But a nice award? Uh, yeah. Lovely. Obviously very well deserved. So yeah. congratulations, Terry. Workers locked out for a year while government legislation changed. It should be changed. And for our generation. And for our kids.
Welcome back. Well, this week, Ryan is looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly in the past year in Newfoundland and Labrador yeah, weather. I understand you're looking back at that wicked windstorm in March tonight. That's right. Uh, the March 11th storm was uh, not only the strongest storm of 2017, it was one of the most memorable storms to hit the province in years. Oh, top wind gust that day reached 160 kilometers per hour in the metro area. 180 kilometers per hour in Argentia and 170 in Greats Cove. The damage in some cases was catastrophic. It's going to take a while uh, to get things straight now for us. Um, so until then, we have nothing but the clothes on our back. In all, 70,000 people lost power that day, <laughs> including the folks who were at mile one taking in the briar. We have about 142 traffic signals that need to be uh, replaced. According to the Insurance Bureau of Canada, damage claims covered by insurance added up to $45 million. Wow. wow. <laughs> I've forgotten yeah. how much that was. But yeah. I do remember those streetlights dangling as if they were on dental floss. That was incredible. Yeah, for songs. sure. Something. Not quite as costly as Igor or that Thanksgiving storm mm. from, uh, from uh, over a year ago, but uh, definitely a costly storm uh, for many. Certainly a memorable one. Yeah, and uh, funny, I was in uh, the hardware store just this fall and somebody was talking to a guy in line ahead of me saying, I still haven't got my siding fixed from that windstorm in March. <laughs> Winter's coming, I've got to get it fixed. So yeah. uh, definitely uh, one that everybody was impacted at least a little bit. For sure. Okay, so from that storm to the next system which is moving in, and a storm I think this will be for parts of Labrador where we have snowfall warnings in effect. For the northern peninsula on the east side, the Straits, and all the way up to the coast of Labrador, Postville and McCovic, Happy Valley Goose Bay is also under this snowfall warning. Special weather statements are in effect for western parts of Newfoundland where we're going to see a messy mix of snow changing to rain. Not a lot of rain, except for the southwest coast where we could see 20 to 30 millimeters, but the big story for the West Coast is going to be those significant snow squalls firing up through Wednesday night and certainly the travel and on Thursday and even into Friday for western parts of Newfoundland is going to be blustery and snowfall totals could add up to more than 20 centimeters locally there Wednesday night through Thursday with additional totals possible through Friday. The other big story, of course, will be the snow for you folks in Labrador. I think Happy Valley Goose Bay looks to be closer to 20 centimeters right now, but the coast of Labrador, especially McCovic, uh, could definitely see some 30 plus centimeter totals there by the end of Thursday with additional totals, uh, additional snowfall possible even Thursday night into Friday. So we'll keep a close eye on this one as it develops over the next day or so. There it is moving in again, a bit of a messy mix across the Maritimes today, talking to uh, Kaylin Mitchell in Nova Scotia saying uh, the changeover from snow to rain may take a little bit longer uh, based on some of the forecast models there. He's of course the meteorologist in Halifax, keep close contact with him. So Definitely prepare for some snow on the ground and falling through Wednesday morning. And their commute in central parts of Newfoundland will be a little on the slick side. Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor back towards the Cornerbrook region. Of course, minus 12 to minus 15 in Labrador City and Happy Valley Goose Bay. It will be a chilly one with a little bit of light snow moving in there as well. So based on what uh, Kaylin was mentioning, again, may take a little bit longer to transition over to rain there through Wednesday afternoon, uh, through Wednesday morning, that is. But certainly by Wednesday afternoon, expecting that change over with some shower and drizzle activity in the mix and already starting to see some of those flurries mix back in along the west coast. Not quite into those squalls by the end of the day Wednesday, but certainly flurries back on the menu. And there are your temperatures anywhere from five on the plus side in the east to along the west coast in Cornerbrook. And we will see that snow building in through the day around plus one, but all snow for the Straits, Mary's Harbor and that southeast section of Labrador and through Thursday night into uh, I should say Wednesday night into Thursday that wind and snow continues and uh, it will be quite blustery along that coast of Labrador through the day on Thursday and there are those west snow squall coast snow squalls 7 60 70 80 kilometer per hour gusts along the west coast there uh, with those squalls winds will be pretty gusty right across the island but those squalls 
with the exception of the Buren Peninsula, won't really quite make it in. Uh, just some flurries, uh, central parts of Newfoundland, St. John's as well, some scattered flurries on the menu, temperatures near minus three. Now those squalls will continue into the forecast on Friday, so if you have some travel plans, do keep that in mind. We'll break down Friday's details and we'll have a look ahead to that weekend leading into Christmas with your seven day outlook coming up in a few minutes. Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. Well, a bleak anniversary in this province's labor movement today. One year since 32 employees at DJ Composites Aerospace Company in Gander were locked out by their American employer. As the Here and Now's uh, Terry Roberts reports, they marked the grim milestone by taking a road trip. Here they are, a road trip of 350 kilometers to the seat of political power in St. John's. For this, a rally to bring attention to their plight, to blast the provincial government. The stress that this has put on the members in the back here, it's been unbelievable. And you look at this government right now that has done nothing to help this problem. And the American company that owns DJ Composites. I hope that over the Christmas season when Razul and Ray are sitting in their fancy, fancy mansions overlooking their golf course that they reflect over this past year and think about my 30 workers that have been locked out. Think about what they have done to them and their families. The faces tell the story. 365 days on the picket line. A bitter dispute with no end in sight, but renewed energy for the workers. This rally today is really what we needed today. Unifor says the company is trying to strip workers of their wages, seniority rights, even their right to unionize, and say the laws offer no protection for the workers. That labor laws in this province have proven to be completely ineffective when dealing with employers who are intent on busting unions. But no sign of backing down. Thousands in check presentations from other unions. Now Unifor has filed yet another bad faith bargaining complaint with the province's labor board. But with no real change in tone following an earlier ruling against the company, some say the real problem is weak government legislation. The government needs to step into this dispute and do something that requires a settlement to end this lockout. This locked out worker even brought along his daughter. We're, we're in the fight of our lives. I mean, and this should, from generation to generation, this should be changed. And for our generation, and for our kids, this should never happen. The company has not responded to an interview request. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Late today, the Department of Labor released a statement. It says labor legislation must balance the rights of employees and employers, and the current legislation provides this balance. Delilah Saunders is heading home. The Inuk activist announced last night that her health is improving and she hopes to return to this province to recover. Saunders is adamant that her liver failure is not a result of alcohol consumption. Family and friends say she was denied a place on a liver transplant waiting list in Ontario because of a requirement that she be sober for six months. Saunders has been an advocate for Indigenous rights since the murder of her sister Loretta in 2014. Her mother says medication is to blame for the liver failure, that Saunders had been taking Tylenol to manage pain from an infected wisdom tooth. In a Facebook post last night, Saunders said she isn't out of the woods yet, but that her health is improving. This was not a suicide attempt, she wrote, nor was it alcohol-induced. Saunders thanked everybody for their love and support. A former cab driver accused of sexually assaulting two women will have to wait until the new year to find out if he, he is found guilty or innocent. Closing arguments were presented this morning in the Lulzen Jacopage case. Jacopage is charged with sexually assaulting two of his female passengers in separate incidents in March 2016. Crown Prosecutor Dana Sullivan said the acts against the victim were done without consent and therefore constitute sexual assault. Defense lawyer Amanda Summers said her client should be acquitted because one of the victims, who was intoxicated, gave conflicting descriptions of the suspect. Justice Rosalie McGraw will rule on the matter on January 29th. Jacopage is already serving a four-year sentence for breaking into the home of uh, following a female passenger in May of 2016. A group of friends had a close call in central Newfoundland when a bullet struck their car window. 
It happened as they were driving on the Trans-Canada Highway. Brian Hunter and his four friends were driving from Grand Falls, Windsor to Cornerbrook last weekend when the bullet hit the passenger side front window. The bullet struck as they were passing a cabin area just a few kilometers east of Southbrook. Fortunately, no one was struck. Hunter reported the close call to the RCMP. I pulled over and I had a look at it. There was a, there was a little piece of slug in my window. It was about the size of a pencil eraser. So I suspect from the power and the sound, it sounded like a 22. Well, at first I thought my tire exploded. It was really loud. And I looked over and my window was just shattered. I didn't know what happened. And the guy in the passenger seat, you wanted to see his face. <laughs> Boy, shocking, yeah. Too many doctors and nurses in Newfoundland and Labrador? Well, how about too many hospitals? That's coming up. Buddy What's His Name and the other fellers are hitting the road for their final big tour. On Boxing Day, the tour is coming to your television. You couldn't have Santa Claus without the elves. Oh. It's the same thing, right? You can't have Buddy What's His Name and the other fellers without the road, you know? The tour, the band, the history, the fans, see it all in still some more to go. 6 p.m. on December 26th, everywhere in Atlantic Canada. Everyone acknowledges the province has a spending problem, and our largest spending is on health care. Now, the polling company Corporate Research Associates says there are too many health care facilities in Newfoundland and Labrador. Don Mills is the CEO of Corporate Research Associates. He's with me now. So, Don, this is a fairly controversial uh, mm. finding of yours. First of all, why have you been counting the number of health care facilities here, and what have you found? Well, it's a common problem right across Atlantic Canada. Uh, you know, we have a small population um, base, which has really not been growing for many, many years. Uh, so in terms of the cost of service delivery, one of the big uh, costs for citizens is health care. So I've been looking at each of the provinces in terms of their facilities. And, uh, you know, so I looked at the number of hospitals in, uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador. There are currently 33 uh, serving a population of just over half a million people. There are, other, there are at least another nine facilities, so there's 42 medical facilities for the province of, uh, 
uh, 500,000. I did uh, wanted to note that uh, in Nova Scotia we have 32 facilities. Uh, the Auditor General just did an assessment of the deferred maintenance on those 32 uh, facilities. It's 1.5 billion. Wow. So I can imagine that there would be a similar number of deferred maintenance on the 42 facilities here. 90% of the population living in, in uh, Newfoundland Labrador are within 70 five kilometers of, a, of, of an urban area. It could be Clarenvale or, or Gander or, you know, uh, any number. And so, you know, the question is, how many facilities would be the most efficient way of delivering high quality service to residents within a reasonable commuting distance? The thing that will be problematic is politically, it's very difficult to say that we, we're going to close a facility uh, because people don't want to give up anything. But if they were told, we're going to close this facility, but we're going to use the resources in a nearby facility to give you more within the same geography. That might be a way of, of uh, um, streamlining uh, the number of facilities that are needed to deliver high quality service. Would it alleviate the fear that uh, reduce the number of facilities means longer wait times? No, it actually might mean quite the opposite. So right now there's a lot of hospitals are having trouble keeping their emergency rooms open, right? It's, they're having trouble uh, recruiting doctors to, to some facilities. Uh, you know, doctors t tend to go where they can practice their their, their trade, and and, and you know, uh, if you're an obstetrician, for instance, and, and you're only doing uh, you know a couple a week, that's probably not good for your practice. So, by consolidating services within a, within the same sort of geography, a reasonable distance from where people live, you might be able to create more specialties in that geography. So maybe people won't have to come to St. John's as often for some things. We have the declining population, yes. as we've uh, talked about. Uh, yeah. How well is the provincial government dealing with that? From my observations, not well. Um, uh, you know, every year in Canada, the population grows 1%. It's been like that for 60 years in Canada, but of that 1%, about 0.7 come from immigration. We haven't had that 0.7 in Atlantic Canada, really, uh, for a very long time. So. Uh, you know, uh, the Harris uh, Center recently uh, did a study on population. They indicated that the population in this province will decrease by 8% by 2030, with about 60,000 more 65 year olds at that point. Uh, it means the labor force is going to be under great pressure. Uh, won't, there will be not enough people to replace the people leaving the, the, the workplace. And the only place that those people are going to come from is off island. So, how are we doing compared to, say, the the Maritimes? Uh, you're you're not even in the game. Wow. Not in the game. I think uh, you're you may be attracting two or three hundred a year. You need the average four thousand for the next twelve years to put it in perspective. Uh, you know, nobody's doing particularly well except for PEI. PEI is doing spectacular in this area. So there are examples within the region that we can learn from. You know, we need to grow our population to be successful think it can be done Absolutely. because the gap you've just described is huge. I know we have to get started right away and then, you know uh, if you at two or three hundred right now by the end of the 12 year period to get to 2030 you're going to need like 15,000 at that point like you know you've got to start and you got have to start soon and, and here's the other trouble that you have that the lack of diversity in the population is really striking here only about 2.4 percent of the population living in Newfoundland were born in another country in Canada that number is 22 percent you know, so there's a big gap in terms of the experience of living with diverse cultures, different races, different, uh, you know, religion, religious backgrounds. So the, the ability to adapt to, you know, that diversity is something that will be challenging for a province like Newfoundland and Labrador. Don Mills, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Dads get some new moves and a new appreciation for what their kids go through.
Time now to meet our young athlete of the day. This is Madison Saunders of Grand Falls, Windsor. Madison is 10 years old and has been a member of the Sparkling Blades Figure Skating Club for the past seven years. And Madison is also involved with cheerleading, gymnastics, and catch my breath, and soccer. <laughs> Great job staying active. Madison, you're today's young athlete of the day. Tuesday. Yes. And that's that means right. time to win two toques. 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 One winner from Facebook, one winner from Twitter. That's mm -hmm. right. And two toque Tuesday. Uh, here's uh, one of last week's winners, Dion Davis. Davis. <laughs> <laughs> Sporting the hat, looking good. Christmassy there, too. Nice. Very good. And we're sticking with Ryan's uh, wind, uh, weather theme this week's question What was your favorite? Weather moment of 2017. Yeah, wind, snow, ice pans. <laughs> not so much. Perhaps all of July. <laughs> Why know? not? Yeah, definitely. Really open to uh, to whatever you want to put there, whether it was your top moment, whether it was your most memorable moment. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of folks, maybe not their top moment, but certainly the most memorable and central would be those back-to-back -back blizzards. Oh, the huge uh, storms. Late March into April. So yeah. go to Ryan's Facebook page and tell us your favorite of weather moment. Uh, or... or you can tweet my account on Twitter, at Anthony Germain. That's right. More toques. And then we'll take a break from the generosity. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Christmas After season and giving <laughs> is over. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, uh, more toques to give away in the new year. Uh, exactly. Definitely. So, uh, okay. So back to the weather. And uh, let's talk about this system because so many people are going to be driving uh, again over the next couple of days, whether you're out traveling around trying to do some last minute Christmas shopping or you are traveling to go and visit family and friends across the province and if you are getting an early start on that travel definitely want to watch the west coast wednesday night thursday into friday again the morning commute will be a little on the uh, slippery side for central west tomorrow morning before that transition over to some rain then back to flurries and again it's the big snow across labrador that's going to be the big story across uh, most of the big land at least, not so much in Lab West where it's going to be light snow, but certainly Happy Valley Goose Bay up towards the coast of Labrador through Wednesday into Thursday and even into Friday. As this system moves up from south to north, there's that again mostly rain for the Avalon, uh, perhaps a little bit of flurry action early on tomorrow morning, but generally it's showers on the go for tomorrow. Then some flurries mixing back in for Wednesday night may even get clipped by a snow squall here across the metro region in the Avalon, uh, but certainly the Buren Peninsula and the southern Avalon as we roll through Wednesday night into Thursday. But most of those squalls will be confined to the west coast. And again, there's that squall action even in the Thursday morning possible with that west southwest flow for the Buren and the Avalon Peninsula. And there's that snow and blow continuing with those strong winds through the day on Thursday. The low starts to depart on Friday, but boy, those snow squalls and onshore flurries aren't going anywhere for the West Coast, which is why uh, this is likely to be the most severe event so far this season. Uh, you folks have seen some snow squalls on the go, but nothing quite like this, uh, which will pretty much last for uh, two, even into three days. Now, a break as we roll into the Saturday time period. This is, of course, Tibbs Eve and an area of high pressure moving in will quiet things down. Good travel conditions for Saturday. Not so much as we roll into the Christmas Eve day. Snow on the leading edge of this. It looks like it will arrive for Sunday morning and we will see a transition to rain. At least that's the latest thinking through Christmas Eve afternoon. A big push of warm air. I think most of the island we'll see at least a brief change over to some rain through Christmas Eve afternoon. Snow on the go for Labrador. It's a quick uh, clear out. And then for Christmas Day, it's a quiet start. And then it looks like another system will come in uh, into the Christmas Eve Boxing Day time period. So uh, this is going to be one, uh, obviously, with back-to-back uh, -back systems that we have to watch. But you can see where uh, certainly some uh, warmer temperatures and not quite Christmas-like for Christmas Eve. That's where Santa is. Then Christmas Day, a bit of a clear and then Boxing Day, that next round rolls in. So be going to be keeping a very close eye on those back-to-back -back systems uh, through that Christmas stretch. And in the Labrador, again, this is likely going to be a snow event for you folks Christmas Eve. And then, of course, uh, likely a snow event, or at least getting into that uh, mix uh, as we roll into the Boxing Day time period. Stay tuned for updates over the next couple days. Anthony. Thanks, Ryan. A group of dancing dads gave their daughters something really special this Christmas. They showed their support by stepping into their kids' shoes, almost literally, <laughs> first in the studio and then on stage. Well, today the Shuffle Pops gave here and now's Megan McCabe a little behind-the-scenes look at their hard work at Revolution's Dance in Mount Pearl. Hooray, it's Christmas time, but there's one lousy tradition. Uh, 
Um, we attended a dance competition in New Brunswick in the fall, and we saw a group of dads up there, and I thought, oh my God, how hilarious. Wouldn't that be a great idea? So um, a lot of the moms were up there, and a few of the dads, and and uh, they were texting back and forth with their husbands who weren't there, and just saying, like, you guys should do this and whatever. So then I, when we got home, I put out an email, and I thought, eh, why not? Let's give it a shot. And I said, I only need eight for it to be a go. So I got 12. And uh, this is what happened. No. <laughs> <laughs> was it hard to choreograph for this group of people? Um, no, not really. They were they were good sports. Uh, it was a lot of laughing. Um, it, it was a lot of fun. Like they were they were a great bunch of guys to work with. Um, so it, it was a good time. Nice. Um, did it give you a little bit more of appreciation for what your kids do? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. More appreciation for what Krista and her team does. <laughs> Yeah, well, a lot of hard work goes in behind that we don't necessarily see. Now, did you expect, because your video has kind of gone viral, re really, like it's very popular. Were you in, expecting that kind of response? I am amazed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, not at all. It was just for a bit of fun for the kids, and it you know, turned out to be a hit. So. I knew it all the time. <laughs> When you had the moves, you had the moves. <laughs> <laughs>
Welcome back, everyone. Well, the three newest crew members of the International Space Station have arrived at their temporary home among the stars. And Scott Tingle of NASA makes his way into the International Space Station for the first time. There's the crew coming through the hatch early this morning. You saw NASA astronaut Scott Tingle there, also arriving after a two-day trip, a veteran cosmonaut from Russia and an astronaut from Japan. Yeah, the team has hundreds of science experiments lined up for the next few months. Nice Christmas hug there uh, but first a little Christmas celebration with some gifts which were sent up via SpaceX cargo ship <laughs> all right well talk about picking up the slack <laughs> a French man has walked his way carefully into the record books with a should we say daring daring balancing crazy, act? whatever <laughs> Pablo Signore is the freshly minted Guinness World Record holder for the longest blindfolded slack line walk. Yeah, he's crossing this canyon in southwest China on a rope that's more than 420 meters long. It took him 26 long minutes. Those would be very long minutes. Um, I want, you know, you want to be blindfolded for this. You really don't want to look down when you're there, would you? I know he's no. tethered, but still, that yeah. is that's, that's yeah. crazy. You'd want to have the tether, though, wouldn't you? <laughs> I would think so. How much to do that? How many million? 28 minutes of that. Yeah. Uh, quickly, our weather pictures of the, of the year continue. And this was my pick again. Just wanted to mention that was taken in Bonavista. Nice. Uh, this was Anthony's pick from St. Anthony. Very happy. Beautiful. I like that picture. All the pictures are gorgeous. Yeah. Gorgeous. I love the rainbow in the background mm -hmm. there. And thanks to Fred Woodman for that contribution. And this was Debbie's pick, uh, Sandringham Sunset. Yes. Very yeah. tranquil yes. and pretty. Nice Very and nice. Calm. Nice and calm. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Jillian Very Penny zen. Turner. Sometimes we really need beautiful. that zen yeah. feeling, don't we? But it's time now to say goodnight. <laughs> All of you, hopefully you're not too zen yet. <laughs> you're watching the show. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night.